morning. I'd like to call this work session of the Southampton Town Board to order on this 22nd day of July 2021. Please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. All right, uh, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Supervisor Schneiderman? Here. Councilwoman Lofstad? Here. Councilman Martell? Here. Councilman Bouvier? Here. Councilman Skibon? Present. All right, so we're all here. The first item uh, is the Bigs and Blue. We're waiting on Chief Skrinicki. Yeah, I just got stuck on the traffic. Oh, traffic? Surprise, surprise, right? <laughs> In He's got time. And I, we, uh, we actually, ha Janice, we have uh, a bill in a resolution in on the traffic committee, right? We do. In the packet. Okay. All right, so we can talk about that later and get some thoughts from the board. Um, and we can get an update from the chief on the blinking light program, how we're making out with that as well when he gets here. So do you guys, while we wait for the police chief, do you want to either review the draft agenda or do some updates? If you review the draft Thank agenda, you. it would be greatly appreciated. We have um, a lot going on downstairs. Okay, but we might get stuck in the middle of it. Okay. So we can try. Uh, how far away is the chief? All right, let's do some updates then. So I'm sorry, Sunday, but if he's about to walk in, and he is about to walk in. There he is. Okay. Never mind. All right. Good morning, Chief. Right on time. You're early. <laughs> well, let good me morning. guess. Traffic. Uh, you got educating. It. No, it was. It, it wasn't really a guess. I, I, I had intel. So. Uh, all right, so the first item on our agenda, and welcome, Chief. I know how busy you are. It's been a busy summer. Um, the first item is Bigs in Blue. It's a program between town police and Big Brothers and uh, Big Sisters. Um, we're joined by our police chief, Stephen Skrinecki, and by Christine Scalera, deputy town attorney, and also uh, uh, the attorney for the police department. So, um, Chief, I'll turn it over to you. And yes. after, when we're done with this presentation, I'd like to just be able to talk a little bit about the traffic issue as well. Of course. Thank you. you, Supervisor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chief. You want me at the podium or? Chief. You can say, we I, have one extra for the clerk. Uh, you I will have one later. Okay. Call me a podium or a uh, Podium, sorry. Oh. We need to have you uh, oh, okay. amplified or recorded, so that's why we put you there. Okay. Um, so what you have before you is a, a PowerPoint presentation, actually, that uh, talks about uh, big brothers and sisters it's called Big in Blue. It's a slight twist on the, or it's actually a uh, subsidy of Big Brothers Big Sisters program that is designed specifically for police departments uh, and community relations. And we look this program over. We think it's, it's um, very applicable to our area. We have some police officers that are interested in getting involved in the program. And if you want to go through this PowerPoint, which I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not presenting it, but you can see the mission statement here is to provide youth facing adversity with strong and enduring professionally supported one-to-one -one relationships that changes their lives for the better and forever. Goals and objectives are to get a one-to-one -one mentoring program that connects youth with police and communities throughout our nation building strong, trusting, lasting relationships. These relationships can help children develop into confident adults and help build stronger bonds between law enforcement and the families we serve. And if you look at the second page on goals and objectives, it's to match, the, this particular program would be to match starting, to match 10 youth uh, in one-to-one -one mentoring relationships with police officers and you might be wondering at that point how many officers we have interested in this. And we already have eight officers, two dispatchers, and two graduates from our civilian academy, which we would 
we would look at as part of this program because they, they have a connection to the police department through the civilian academy already. So I think it's, it's very encouraged, I'm very encouraged certainly by the, um, the interest in this before we've even launched it. Um, and I think it, it offers a lot of potential. Included in the uh, goals and objection, uh, objectives are to increase pro-social skills and behavior, to increase school engagement and academic efficiency, to decrease the risk of juvenile delinquency or rates of recidivism for youth already involved in a justice system. And if you continue on down, it talks a little bit about the, the children. So this program is designed for youth, both uh, female and male, ages 7 to 16. Uh, they have to reside either in Suffolk or Nassau County. I'm quite sure ours will probably all reside in Suffolk and preferably in this township that need uh, additional support from a caring adult. And the common uh, factors that, that exist in the program, parents and caregivers engage in a partnership with big brothers and big sisters to build the biggest possible future for that child. And also uh, uh, another factor here is the youth has to want to have a mentor in his or her life. Some uh, factors that, that take place or that we look at when we select the child um, is children that come from a single parent household, um, history of trauma or mental health diagnosis, failing in school, uh, parental incarceration, low income, high crime neighborhoods. Now, essentially, we're, we're trying to reach out to children that may not have the benefit of a solid home and uh, you know, good economic uh, background. Uh, positive impacts of the system um, is that in this, this system and this program has shown to uh, increase academic performance and social competency prepares for post-secondary education to improve economic outcomes, reduces absenteeism and engaging in risky behavior such as alcohol and drug use, and the research that's been done, this is hard research regarding the program, shows that 97% of littles, they call the children in the program, they call them littles, 97% of littles stated working hard in school is very important. This is after they're in the program, they, they come to these realizations. 95% of littles stated that going to school and getting a good education is important. 94% of littles stated that graduating from college is very important. So children work hard, they recognize the value of education, and they set a goal of going to college, uh, and that certainly puts them in a position more likely to succeed in life. More driven results, 46% of the littles were less likely to use drugs, 27% were less likely to use alcohol, 33% were less likely to engage in violence. And ways that people get involved uh, through the program, a, a police officer, or as we're going to introduce this a little beyond the police department to this well, dispatch is a part of the department, but to our <coughs> civilian academy graduates, if they want to become one, um, that's a person that can be involved. Um, you can also get involved in this program, and if, if, you, um, if, if you support the program, we'll be rolling this out with abilities for people to host a big in blue recruitment event. Uh, people can commit to becoming a bigs in blue partner or, or giving a site for different programs. Um, people can participate in different agency events. And I'm, I'm quite sure that uh, we will get uh, from our community people who may not take on a child, um, but I, I think we'll get a lot of community support for this program. I'm quite confident that, I, that we can tap into people who are going to see the benefits of this program, who have the ability and the wherewithal to make contributions to the program, whether it's financial contributions or time or um, food or properties or, you know, a, a number of ways that people can support the program. So that's, that's a quick um, oversight. Just to give you a little, um, a little more information, uh, as most of you know, we are right now, this week, running a youth academy. 
for the first time, a police-run youth academy. And we're running that uh, through Remsenburg School District. They're kind enough to allow us to use a school, but the children are not all from Remsenburg. They're from different communities within the township. And today is the fourth day of that one-week program. Um, in fact, I'm heading there right after this meeting. The, I stopped there on Tuesday. It is so well received. The kids that are in this program are loving it. Uh, we have explorers that are uh, from our Explorer program that are assisting our police officers running that program. And a lot of the kids in the summer youth program, which is only a week, are already expressing an interest in becoming police explorers. And this kind of all ties into our robust community involvement with youth programs that I, I'm, I'm really proud of. I think that, that we're really, we've make, we made great strides in, this, in that field. Um, and I think, uh, I think they're going to pay big dividends. The dividends for this interaction with youth are down the road. You know, you don't see them immediately. Um, but where I, I just heard it from the teachers and principal in Remsenburg uh, when I was stopped there last week. She said, you can't believe the difference just having, and our SRO program fits into this as well. She said, the difference between kids, when a, when a police officer used to come on the property, it would be, oh my God, there's a police officer on the property. And now it's, oh, it's officer so-and-so. Is he coming into our room today? So it's a, it's a dynamic change in the way the youth are seeing the police, feeling about police, which is all positive, especially in, in the climate that we're living in right now. So, Chief, first of all, yeah, I, I mean, I agree that you guys are making great strides with you. Right? The school resource officer program, the youth academy, the explorers program, and lots of other things that you're doing, youth court, and all, the, all these things. Um, and I, I certainly gr agree with the laudable goals of this program. I, I was a big brother. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, and it's a, it's a great program. I also did it voluntarily. It was a tremendous amount of time. You know, we don't get to pick our parents. And there are lots of kids out there who could use some extra attention and direction. Um, I'm also, though, concerned at the same time with a, a couple aspects. One, that this may be open to kids from other outside of our taxing jurisdiction, you know. Um, but also, I know how stressed your officers are right now, time-wise, um, that we have this population that seems to be soaring and um, placing additional demands for overtime, et cetera, and knowing how much time it takes to be a big brother or a big sister, I don't know how we could possibly take something like this on. Who is paying for this? Are they doing this in their off hours or are they doing this on their on hours? And if they are, then they're obviously not available to do the other things. So you're going to have to answer that question. No, that's an excellent question. Uh, and, and this is 100% voluntary for police officers and it's 100% off duty. Okay. So this this is this I'm, this and, and they should have said that from the start. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to hold you up to that. <laughs> Keep you paying attention. You didn't say that. You know. uh, yeah. No. This 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 would be um, this is funded by Big Brothers Big Sisters and any fundraising that we might do um, individually within the program for the Southampton Town Police Department pro portion of the program which I'm, I'm certain we can, we can probably, as I mentioned before, I think we can get some significant sponsorship for the so program. the kids aren't with the officer on duty? Oh, never. No, no. Okay. Because no. it could be, be a real distraction. I mean, clearly we would probably, depending on the age of the child, as we do now with explorers, and this goes up to 16. So if we have a, a youth that's 14, 15, 16 years old, um, as we do with, with our youth now, we, we might invite them into the precinct, show them around, uh, you know, maybe take them on a, uh, a ride along or something like that. It would be all very structured the way we do with anybody right now. But the officers would not be administering this while they're on duty at all. So it would take no time from their normal schedule. And I agree with you. They're, they're very overworked. And I'm, I frankly am a little pleasantly surprised that we have eight officers that are already they're saying interested. I'd be interested in doing this. So they're not going to get compensated for this? Nope. Other than the other than, other than the great feeling you get in the warmth, the warmth of your heart. Yeah, that's it. Well, um, well, 
with that being said, it's a home run. If they have the time to do it and they're volunteering, and I, you know, we just, you know, I, I, we have enough kids in our community that need that yeah. extra guidance and love and support yeah. and attention that, um, that you know, I, I hope that we focus primarily on kids from our community. Yeah, my thought would be to, uh, my thought would be to introduce the program to find the littles, if you will, to, to, to recruit them uh, would be to go through some of the organizations in the township like the Anti-Bias Committee and some of the other committees that already exist that, that kind of relate with the groups that we're looking at um, to push the message out that we're, this program exists and see if we have any children. I would go work directly with the schools we, we, we're counselors. definitely going to go through the, the school. Counselors, the counselors, the social workers at the school, they sure. know those kids who are not getting yeah. proper direction yeah. at home. Well, fortunately, we have some people on the Antibiotics Task Force who are involved in the schools. Yeah. And, well, we'll, we'll, in, in we, we'll cover ways. the gamut. I mean, we're, you know, when we're, we're looking Employees, for... Employees, I'm, I'm saying, of the Absolutely. But as you know... Uh, school teachers, they'll, they'll know where you need to focus, I would think. Yeah. Yeah, and our, and our school resource officer it will be, you know, very uh, linked into this program, um, and that's the job of our school resource officer, really, is to identify those kinds of kids and kids start... falling through the cracks, basically. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, and I don't know about now, but in the past, my daughter was a big, they, the schools have the big, you know, big brother, big sister mm -hmm. program within yeah. the schools, so yeah. they're there already. I mean, the reputation of the program is great. Um, I, frankly, this is new to us, and I don't. I know there's none on Long Island anyway. P Bigs in Blue is new to Long Island. So if if you give me the green light to go ahead with this, um, we'll be the first police department in Long Island. I'm pretty sure to to initiate the program through the police department. So another thing I'm well, proud of. How much of, of your you. time this is going to take? Pardon me? How much of your time will this take? If we give you the go-ahead to do this, how involved are you going to be in this program? Because I'm, I'm debating on whether I'm going to take a child myself on, but I probably don't have the time to do that. But I'll, I'll oversee it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that I can find the time. This is worthwhile. Is there a way that it, this could be focused to the South Fork, at least not necessarily Southampton Town, but at least uh, the area? Yeah, I mean, we're going to really try to keep the focus in the township, mm -hmm. um, and and it's really going to be a matter of do we have enough littles in the township, and I think we will. Uh, you know, we, I only have eight right now, eight volunteers. I'm quite sure we'll find eight littles in our township, uh, and that'll be our primary goal. Right, Big Brothers Big Sisters is a well-established organization. They they know what they're doing. They know how to do the outreach on this. So you know, I certainly applaud the program every. Every child needs purpose, identity, and community, and, and this would provide Yeah, I mean, the twist on this, the slight twist on this is the child, the little, um, is, is, is coupled with somebody who's in government and in law enforcement, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, where you, you know, there's plenty of bigs out there that are great people. Um, this is just a little bit of a, a different twist in that you're going to be with a police officer, but that, that certainly will help our police and community relations. So, can I just just a word of advice? Having been a big brother, mm -hmm. um, you know, <coughs> some of these kids are real at-risk kids. Some of these kids have history of you know problems in the schools. And, um, I'm sure your officers all can handle it, but they ought to know what they're getting into, and um, it, you know, it can be a big demand on time. Um, particularly if they're paired up with somebody who, you know, is a real challenge. Well, the, the program, and, and I'm sure most of, the, um, most of the bigs are going to use more time, but the program actually only calls for, you know, several hours a month. Um, but it depends, I'm sure a person like you, and I, I know you well enough to know you don't do anything halfway, yeah. you know, halfway um, probably well exceeded that, and right. some of these officers... I just want to make too. sure people don't go in with this, I, I mean, it may turn out that they're, you know, it's, it's like, oh, I'm going to be a parent to this kid, oh, it's great, we're going to have fun together, blah, blah, blah. Some, some of these kids are really challenging. No, I know. Really challenging. You know, I got paired with a, with a really challenging kid you know, almost got me into a car accident, you know, so it's, 
it's uh, they should know what they're getting into and who they're being paired with, and we get a, yeah, but, you know listen and not go into it sort of like you know this is just going to be a fun thing. It, it, it can be a fun thing. But it also can be a really challenging thing. I as think well. you know, as police officers, I think they recognize that they, you know, they deal with situations where they're dealing with children like this all the time. So, um, I, I'm, I'll, I'll certainly bring that message to them and make sure they understand that. But I, I think they're probably better positioned than a lot of people in society to handle that type of child because they handle those crisis situations every day. So, you know, another crisis to them when they're off duty is another crisis that they're going to manage. Um, and I, I really applaud them for even wanting to do that. Um, but I'm quite confident they'll know how to manage it because they've trained and that's what they do for a living. So they're really excellent bigs, if you will, because they have that experience and they have that training to, to handle people that, that may have some issues like you're describing. Yeah. Christine, I, you were... Yeah, I was just going to add, just so you know, that there is an interview process. So the Big Brothers and Big Sisters of, you know, the bigger corporation, they'll conduct interviews and start... So yeah. they'll assess both the while. officer in this case and the kid that they're matching Yes, them with. they will speak with them, they'll interview, and they take part in the matching up process so that they make sure that they have a good, you know, big with a little that works. Yeah, okay, good. Well, I, I think it's a great great idea. I mean, anything that we can do along those lines is a, is a great idea, and I agree with the supervisor. The cost is obviously a factor, so that doesn't seem to be an issue. Um, my one question was, how does this, is there an overlap with the explorers, and how how does that work, and when kid, the kids get up to that age, or is there a pathway to uh, to move forward? Yeah, that's a great, great question, and, and there is not a definitive overlap to the explorer program, or Better put, it's not a necessary overlap, but there certainly can be an overlap. So the, the officers will make these children aware of the Explorer program, introduce them to the concepts of the Explorer program. If they're interested in the Explorer program and they fit, they'll be welcome into the Explorer program for sure. Great, great, because you know, it's, it's a really successful program. It just seems like a natural, uh, a natural uh, pathway to follow. Right, and as you know, we, we've been, this, this just brings in another level, but we, we have so many levels of contact now that are working for us between the Explorer program and some of the, some of the kids in the Explorer program come out of there and they go to work for us once they're, you know, in their late teens and they have a driver's license and they become traffic control officers with the township and some of them become part-time police officers. Uh, and some of those part-time police officers come on to be full-time police officers with us, and it it just gives us a lot of a lot of contact, um, a lot of good relationship building, and it gives us uh, when we look for our permanent police officers, we have a long history um, sometimes with some of these individuals, so we can really pick good individuals that are going to fit into our program, our police program, and, and it's been working tremendously well. Well, like between team. Jim Banks and yeah, it's, I, I I use that word sometimes. It's a farm team. Any, between else? Jim Banks and and Denise Mergen, uh, at least within the Antibodies Task Force, you know you have an overwhelming force there to help f find eight kids. Excellent. I think they're going to find a lot more than that, so you'll have a waiting list. I I, I think it's great. I totally support. Christine, it. do we? Yeah, it, it sounds like everybody supports it. Absolutely. Yes? Yeah. Do we need to do a resolution? Or? I'm going to do a memorandum of understanding that I'm working on right now with them. So we'll have a resolution to authorize your signature on that or the chief's signature on that. Um, just so that'll come before the board either at this I mean, meeting or the next meeting. The officers already can become big brothers and big sisters. They don't need me to or the town board to say it's okay. So it's really basically allowing the chief to coordinate and promote the program within Correct. the department. And, yeah. Exactly. It's promoting using resources. Right. And, you know, it will, with your blessing, we'll launch it. I, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, how much traction it will take, but I certainly think it's worth giving it a shot. And we'll report back and let you know how we do. Okay, everybody's good? Great. Thank you, right. yeah. All right, don't go anywhere, Chief. Because <laughs> if you went anywhere, you probably hit traffic, and that's what I'd, uh, I wanted to talk to you really uh, briefly about. So two things. I have a resolution. Um, uh, in draft form before the board to create this um, traffic solutions uh, task force. 
and uh, have you and I as co-chair and Councilman Schiavone as a liaison to the police department on it. We have a, a number of other individuals, some named and some named by title, like a, the county rep and the state rep. Uh, we don't know who those individuals will be yet. Um, but we're going to try it. You know, we're, we're getting people are emailing us their ideas. Like I just got one on Flanders uh, from Flanders saying, can we put those induction loops into those side streets where we're going to try to yep. change the lights? I guess Oak Street. Yeah, Oak and Longwood. Oak Boulevard or whatever in Longwood um, so that they stay green until there's a car. And then that sets up the cycle, which is which is great. I didn't realize they didn't have those loops there they have them in lots of other places now um, so I look forward to that and we'll, we'll move quickly and the resolution calls for some sort of not necessarily a report but a uh, you know the items the list of the proposed or the action, rec items. action ideas action items uh, by the end of the year um, though I'd like to if there's good ones that we can implement sooner, like the blinking light idea, um, we should. Now, uh, I reached out to you, as you know, um, recently to see if we can get, uh, and this was largely in response to the, the crowd that was here uh, um, on the uh, Hampton Bays parkland alienation bill and the cons it, you know, I think we were all aware of it, but it really just underscored um, the frustration people are having um, on Fanning and some of the other um, back roads in Hampton Bays with the trade parade in the morning. That that backlog, which is winding its way to Canoe Place Road, where there's a, 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 a signalized intersection there, and uh, people are trying to get around downtown Hampton Bays because they know that it'll take forever to get through there and then they'll make the right on the red or when it's green. Um, so, I, you know, I came to you and I said, well, can we get the lights blinking at Canoe Place Road? Can we get it blinking um, Andrews at St. Andrews Road, which is a re both of those are relatively recent lights and they're both on the county road and then you know, Tuckahoe Road on 39, the Watermill Light, which is, you know, always backed up. And uh, and then on, you had suggested also adding the ones on uh, State 24. Route 24, either the Blink or Longer Green. And we realized that these roads are not our roads. These signals are not our signals. And that we can't just do this on our own. Uh, the suggestion was 5 a.m. to 7 a.m., which is awfully early in the morning. But it's amazing how much traffic there is at 5 a.m. Uh, it's just mind-boggling that already at 5 p.m. It's a, it's a traffic jam. Uh, 5 a.m. It's a traffic jam, sorry. So um, have, I know you've, you've reached out to both the county and the and state. The state. Yes. So can you uh, uh, tell us what you've heard or have you heard anything? Well, you, you've just outlined the pilot with those intersections you just described. And, and as you've mentioned, some of them are county and some of them are state. I had phone call conversations with the county. I was hoping that I would hear from them actually by today. I haven't. It's my plan later today to circle back with them uh, and see if they will give us permission for the county roads. State is requiring a formal letter, uh, which we've submitted, and we've backed that up with a request to Assemblyman Thiel. Uh, to get his endorsement on the pilot and see if he can also help to push that that through. Um, these are two relatively heavy lifts, uh, unfortunately, to get the county and the state to commit to this. Uh, from experience, I know they're hesitant to do that. Uh, but we, uh, in, in our conversations and in our letter, we explain the situation as you just explained it uh, and the frustration that our citizenry is faced with and, and the amount of phone calls that come into town board and come into my office that are nonstop this year. Uh, so we've certainly expressed to them uh, the situation very clearly, um, and we recognize that this pilot may or may not 
uh, impact it, but we feel that it's worthwhile to put into place. You had asked me to see if we could do some kind of study that would demonstrate success or failure on the pilot, which is hard to do um, because it's not, you know, the conditions every day change. For example, Monday of this week, for reasons I can't explain, was very light traffic. Uh, today, I'm, I just came from Hampton Bays to come here and took me 30, over 30 minutes. I wouldn't expect that at 1030. Um, so you don't really know, but we've, we've put our drone up um, every morning, as you and I discussed, at exactly the same time, and we're getting some overhead footage of the traffic each morning at exactly 7 a.m., and, and boy, that, that footage at 7 a.m. tells the story that we're all talking about. If we get the approval for the light changes, which I'm hoping we will, uh, we'll put the same drone up in the same place at the same exact time, um, and it's not exactly scientific, but I think it will give us an image of, uh, if it's successful, an image of traffic pattern changes, uh, and we'll at least have a good feeling that this is moving in the right direction, or uh, not. If um, you're able to get the county, can I say green light for the, yeah. for the yellow light? Mm -hmm. if, you can get, if you can get permission from the county, um, can we at least get the Montauk Highway lights on blink? That, absolutely. Oh, on yeah, state? definitely. My, my thoughts are, and I know it's your thoughts as well, um, if we can get one or the other, whichever one comes first, we're going to initiate that portion immediately. Absolutely. Every little bit helps. Is there more that I can do to try to get the go-ahead? And, and maybe the, the related question is, is there a point where you on um, you know, because it's becoming a problem for, let's say, ambulance or police officers, where you can say, you know what, I need to blink those lights. I need to get this traffic moving so that I can clear this problem on the back roads. Is there a, ever a point where you can just preempt the state or county? On a temporary basis, yes. Under a temporary emergency, yes, and we do that. But on a long-term basis, probably not. Um, I, I, I don't think I have the authority to do that without their permission or knowledge. Um, I'm hopeful that uh, we're going to get their permission. And, and what you might be able to help with is contacting the county executive in Suffolk and making him aware of the situation, which I haven't gone to that point. But if the board wants to touch base with the county exec's office. And, certainly give them a call. Yeah. Um, again, you know, this is, this is a, a trial. I, 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 as much as I think this is a worthy pilot, I, I also don't want the public to be over expecting that this is going to solve all the problems. Um, it might help, and if this helps, we'll look for another piece that might help, and we put enough pieces together, maybe we make a difference. I, I should also uh, assure you, and I mean, I've had some uh, feedback from the public about the pilot, that we will have police officers monitoring these changes if we make the changes, if we get the permission to do that. I'm not just going to switch the lights and walk away. We'll have officers watching that intersection, uh, particularly up in Flanders. I say this for the people in Flanders. I know they've expressed great concern about if we, if we have 24 moving swiftly, which is what we want to do, that they'll never be able to get out of their side streets. Um, so if we see that, we'll take action to correct that. We, we, I want to assure everybody that we're not going to just leave this unmanned. We would leave it unmanned maybe after a day or two if it's, it, it's very obvious to us in the first two days that it's not a problem. We're not going to necessarily stay there all the time. But we will monitor to make sure it's not causing any um, unrelated or unexpected uh, traffic hazards. Should we use some digital signage too? Because sometimes I find once you put the cop at the intersection, everybody's slowing down. Yeah, absolutely. And they should, but they, you know, but we want them to actually keep moving. The whole idea is to keep moving, to right. not come to a crawl. Right. So, uh, and I, I like the idea of having an officer around, yeah, but, but how but, you but position this, this, the officer this, may matter. And if you, you know, if we put up a, a digital sign that alerts people to, you know, a, oh, we're in a pilot program, blinking light. I don't know how you do this. Uh, proceed. 
not perceive a caution, but... Well, when I, when I say I'll have an officer observe this, I agree with you. A visible officer will slow traffic down. But I can do that in a way where, unlike when we're at a scene of an accident and we have to be very visible and it clearly slows traffic down, to have an officer observing an intersection, he can do that from a distance and not be seen by traffic there. So I, I think we can manage that in a way that it's not going to negative. where they put, put the car. Yeah. And what <laughs> car they're in. I, they don't necessarily have to be in a marked car to, to do this. So we, we'll find a way. Park on the side street. Or yeah. Under state law, a blinking light will slow traffic down. I mean, it's, well, I'm not telling you the law, but, uh, you know, we're supposed to slow down when you see a blinking flash. Correct, but not as much as a red light. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't right. stop it, but it slows right. it. So right. I don't know. right. So but it, like a roundabout does slow traffic down, but mm -hmm. it keeps it flowing. And I think yeah. that's the key is to keep right. it moving because once they stop, and a lot of it's heavy equipment, like big trucks, you know, you have to, there's the reaction time. Okay, it's green now. And now you have to start moving one by one. Each car has to get into motion. And by the time everybody's in motion, it goes red and they have to stop again. And there's so a, there's like a lot of studies done uh, on that, particularly with heavy trucks and the time it takes a truck to get back to momentum of even 30 right. or 40 miles an hour. Tom Neely has a simulation of that, and everybody should take a look at it. It's very interesting. Yeah, it, it, there is a lot of time to get back up to, to 30 to 40 miles an hour. So, right. So, Chief, the main goal here is to to make the highways, the highway 27 more and 39, more attractive for commercial drivers and and traffic in general. So, perhaps if if this does happen and the county and the state go along, we should probably put a sign out on 27 to let people know, to let commuters know, and the trade parade know that this is going to be the case in the next couple of weeks. Right. And hopefully they will stay on the highway rather than going into the back. Exactly. But, and I think, you know, with if we're successful mm -hmm. and that traffic continues to move better, the Waze apps and the, all those apps are going to advise motorists that stay here because it is moving. So, Could you know. Could we use signage to say, please stay on the main road? I don't you know, know that people. Or, you know, an idea Tommy John's been promoting too is, you know, make, can we actually prohibit some of the commercial traffic on the back on the neighborhood roads? There's a problem with that, and that is we already have prohibitions to a lot of commercial traffic on back roads, and our police force is so tied up and so thinly spread right now. Uh, it's hard for us to enforce some of them that are in place now. So uh, unless we have major issues with commercial on back roads, I wouldn't recommend more restrictions than we have unless there's a real good reason. The best thing is to get the main roads flowing. Yeah. Then there's no need. They won't go to. And that's exactly what I'm trying to say. If, if yeah. the main road is going, you won't need any sign to say stay on it. Have you thought about a no right on red at Canoe Place? I mean, it'll back up like crazy, but then maybe nobody will go that way because they know it's they're going to be better off staying on the main road. I haven't thought of that. That's, uh, that is an interesting idea that would hurt the residents a bit, and I don't know how they would appreciate that. Um, it was well, certain. So part of the problem is. I mean, we could do it at a certain time of day, no right on red early in the morning. Um, I mean, part of the problem is, at least, this, and, and you probably would observe this, is when they're making those constant right on reds, they're actually slowing down the traffic on the main road. Yep. The main road has the green, yep. and, but they have to slow down to let these people in. It's just some one lane over there. They nose in there. Yeah, yeah. they nose in there, and it's a merge point. Yeah. And so at least while it's green, more cars would get through. Well, if, you did, if you did that and prohibited the right on red, even if it was, like I said, I, if we were going to do it, I would so, only do it in the morning, right, um, you would then eliminate that one that one bypass route, you would probably produce another bypass route. Where that would be, I'm not might sure. Cut through the restaurant there. Right? Yeah. So if, if we were to do any of this, is there a way to somehow inform ways or some of this other artificial intelligence of these changes immediately? I know it's a new technology, but you know perhaps we could use the technology to our advantage if we were to put a no right on red to inform them immediately that this is the case or the blinking light program and maybe they'll change their algorithms. I don't know that you can do that. I could explore that, but I know that their, their messaging is based on real-time information. 
So regardless of what your message might be, they make their money and they're successful on based on their real-time information to drivers, and, and that's based on reporting back to, to the company, and some of that's done right. automated by cell phones that they track, and some of it's done by people calling in and actually letting them know, but most of it now is automated. They, they, you know, your phone is telling them where you are and how well you are moving. So I, I really think at the end of the day, if, if this program is going to work, it, the message will get there mm -hmm. almost automatically. By the same token, if it fails, that message will be there as well. And this idea of five to seven, it sort of sends a message to all the contractors. If you want to get through, yes. This is the time to definitely. Go if if we see if you some wait improvement till after seven, you expect. The so I, I had a question about that, and you know, I'm I'm just an en not a, I'm an engineer, not a traffic engineer, but Nor what I <laughs> what I observe is quite often. I remember when I was learning how to drive. The big message was slower traffic, stay to the left. Faster traffic, get in the right you know right hand lane. That never seems to happen anymore on 27 and 39. Um, I was wondering, is there a, a way to look at that mix, that traffic mix, and restrict commercial traffic to certain portions outside of the, of the particular roads in question at, at certain times, as opposed to allow car traffic to move, which tends to sort of group up on one side all the time, and then you have trucks coming in and out that just slow everything down, and people get trapped. Uh, so you see those clusters of... That's an of inter another interesting point. I mean on the LIE for example commercial traffic is not permitted in the left lane right um, but so you know you could look at that um, on on County Road 39 and on parts of Sunrise Highway where when it goes down to two lanes there's no restriction a commercial vehicle can be in either lane that would be a county conversation to have with the county since it's a county road but that's that's an interesting thought to restrict commercial vehicles to the right lane only in those locations. And I, as you know, some parts of County Road, particularly if you're going west, there's only one lane, right. so it's not going to be applicable there. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I would not expect that that would have a, a, a big effect, but again, as we keep saying, none of these Nobody things knows. are going to have a big effect. It's a matter of uh, making a lot of little changes that collectively may make some impact. Um, I'll keep that, that thought. These are two good, interesting thoughts, that the no right on canoe in the morning, and we can certainly have some conversation particularly if, the, if we have more conversation with the county about the change in the light structure, we can talk to them a little bit about the lanes and commercial use of lanes. But I, I, the, actually, the, the no right on red in the morning for canoe might be an interesting thing to, to, uh, to try out. And we could, we could do that in a number of ways. Test it, see yeah. what happens. Yeah. Uh, uh, I uh, is there any way to limit it to... No. <laughs> I know where you're going. <laughs> Only because I've already had somebody come and say... I, 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 I said the residents are going to be unhappy, but I can't... They have to go up well, they can't happy. go on Gravel yeah. Hill. They no. have to go... I, I know, I know. You I know. know. But I don't think there's a lot of residents in between 5 and 7 a.m. I mean, we'd have to... Yeah, I... I Understood. Totally you got to try something. I, I totally, and my first thought is that's going to be a residential complaint immediately, and unfortunately I, I can't, there can't is stick it a cause and say, okay, you're a resident, go ahead. Is, the only way that works is if it's really just push, pushing all that traffic back to Montauk Highway. And so, you know, you don't, right now there's a tremendous backlog on Canoe Place. I mean, just, and it's and not just Canoe Place. It comes up, then it comes so Newtown the Road. It comes Newtown and they bang a Yui. That's another yeah, issue. Yeah, that, that, is that, that doesn't help either. You know, mm -hmm. right. The, I know the fear is that if you put no right or red, it's actually going to be a worse backlog. Mm -hmm. And that may be the case, in which case it's a terrible idea. We need a road to read it might there. have the reverse effect. If everybody knows that, they stay on the main highway. They don't take the back roads. But we, we won't, we don't know. It it's, might be worth looking at. Um, we really need to, I think, better understand right. how those rights on reds are impacting the main flow of traffic. That's the key. If they really are slowing down the traffic at that intersection, then we've got a problem. 
Well, I would certainly recommend that we take it one step at a time so we can see what each step, the value or, or, or no value in each step as we make those steps. Right. So we, you know, right now, let's, my recommendation would be stay with the lights. It's good to you change one variable at a time. Not, yeah. Otherwise, you don't know exactly what yes. caused the result. Yeah. So we, we have a, you know, if we get the approval for these light changes, that'll be an interesting study. Let's look at that for a week or so and see what happens. The chief on Flanders Road by Long Neck Boulevard, we're going to have that light is going to be blinking. Yes. So anybody making a left is either going to sit there for an extended period of time or have to go negotiate, and make a uh, yeah, U-turn. find an opening. Yeah. And, and, and if we find, and I, I do predict that finding an opening might be difficult, and that's why I'd have to have an officer look at that. And if it's too hard to find that opening, then we have to do something to change the timing rather than just keep it flashing all the time. So, you know, we, we really need to make the change. We really need to observe sure. what that change is, how that change is going to affect the, the, the lesser roads, the back roads. It's, it, obviously, these things are, are done to improve the main road traffic, and I'm pretty confident it will. The, the question will be what would be the adverse effect on the back roads which has potential, and, and, and clearly the residents are concerned about it. I hear their voices loud and clear, so if you're watching this right now, we hear it, we'll watch it, we, we won't leave you hanging, we promise. There are a couple of places, Chiefs, where uh, driveways act as cut-throughs, and one is right at the intersection that we're talking about, so... It, driveways? What, Mm -hmm. A canoe place. And oh, I see. What Montauk you're Highway and it's like commercial. Do they chain that in the morning? They, they, I mean, because I know cars who will cut through, and uh, you know the residents know about this. But then you know people who are traveling through, they see it and they learn, and you know, and then that becomes a cut through. Like, Is you're it? talking about parking lots, basically. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah, driveways, parking lots that go behind a building. You know, they're. These are bailout situations for, you know. And well, you know, when, when yes. everything is backed up, every crack gets exposed. Um, exactly. And, and people find those little cracks. And uh, it's just it's illegal, like, isn't it? It's against the law to do that. It's against the law to avoid a traffic signal light. Yes. Uh, by cutting a corner, going through a gas station to avoid a traffic signal light. That's I know that for a fact. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to ask you how, Councilman. My younger days. <laughs> Beyond the statute of limitations. Okay. You mean you were just driving through to check the gas price and you saw it was too high, so you can. <laughs> I think it was an attempt to check the law. <laughs> so, all right. Um, well, yeah, I, I'll reach out to the county executive if that helps. If you, yeah, I think that would. Um, and make sure he understands the urgency and that you've made the formal request to yeah. what, the DPW? Yes. Okay. Um, Okay, um, and the state, you've reached out to Assemblyman Thiel already. Yes. Um, I've spoken to him as well on this, so um, he's, I, I know, going to try to help us with the state DOT. And um, let's hope we get permission to give this a, a try. Keep our fingers crossed that we get the permission and then keep our fingers crossed that it makes a difference. Well, you know, the Cone program on County Road 39 started out as a pilot program, right? Um, and I got permission to try it for one week, and it was uh, it worked so well right. that after a week, this was uh, uh, County Executive Levy was in office at the time. After after one one week, our phones just were r ringing off the hook with people saying, "You, you got to you got to keep it going. You got to put the cones back." Mm -hmm. And this was like it started out. I think one I want to say like March April. We, we tested it, we did the one week pilot program, and it ended up setting the cones up all the way till no Thanksgiving that year. And then we built the extra yeah, lane. Yeah, it changes so the road. We couldn't afford to keep doing the cones. But we knew that that extra lane made a fundamental difference. And it, it's funny, somebody, I was at a, a meeting the other day, and somebody said, oh, the extra lane didn't, you know, so the traffic is still backed up, the extra lane obviously didn't help. And I'm like, can you, can you imagine today without that extra lane? No. You know, oh, it helped. 39 actually flows pretty well. It's actually Sunrise Highway that seems to be backed up. But um, 39 without that lane would be unlivable Absolutely. at this point. So uh, it definitely worked. Um, and 
if for many, many years we didn't see the, you know, the big bad, the giant backup even on, on 27, and now it's come back. There's clearly more traffic. Yeah. And we don't have the train in the morning, which would help. Um, and it's still hopeful we'll, we'll see the train resume. It got suspended because of COVID. And uh, it was growing in ridership. Right. And, uh, you know, you know, I appreciate uh, Assemblyman Thiel and his leadership on that issue and um, forceful voice for reinstituting the train. And I, I hope we see it come back. We're ready. Yeah. We're ready if it does. And, uh, you know, one of the ideas um, I've been kicking around is if we do get the train and hopefully more frequency of trains, because the Long Island Railroad is considering uh, building some parallel track sections, like spurs, so that, because right now you have one set of tracks, you got to send the train from Spionk to Montauk, wait for it to get all the way back to Spionk before you can send another train. If you had places where you could pull the empty train over, and let the populated train go by, they could do a lot more trains. Unquestionably. Um, so, yeah. um, but one idea that I've um, been kicking around, and I think Councilman Lofstad actually sort of threw this idea out initially was to, because a lot of the workforce will not take the train because they need their, you know, they need their tools, they, they need their circular saws, they need their whatever, you know, equipment, uh, table saws, um, landscaping equipment, whatever it is. What if we had a, a lot that may be secured with a fence and video cameras somewhere pretty far east, maybe Bridgehampton or uh, Wayne Scott, um, and the workers then could get on the train, reliably get to East Hampton in like a half an hour, they're 45 minutes rather than two hours sitting in traffic. And then we could shuttle them to the lot you know, using our commuter connection. And then they could get in their equipment, work all day on the east end, park it, take the shuttle back to the train, and get back. It would save them so much time. And you know the expression, time is money. Sure. Um, you know, it's a several hours of their day not sitting in traffic. So um, it. It could be a home run. I, I don't. It's worth exploring, and you know that maybe we'll come out of this um, committee that we're this task force. But uh, um, there's a lot of people talking about roundabouts and where roundabouts could go. Um, there's a, a resident of Watermill who's you know, been giving me drawings about where how you could eliminate the Watermill light with two roundabouts, one east and one west of Watermill. Um, you know, there's a lot of ideas out there. And Jay, one idea that I was interested in in uh, terms of the trade parade and the workers that, that are coming in and out, I noticed that um, many of the jobs, uh, many of the construction jobs require that their workers take their private cars to the job site. And you see, and you've seen this, Chief, you see 30 cars, 15 cars at a particular job site, and they begin paying them when they get on the job. Um, you know, when I was in construction, we used to report to the to the shop, to the you know headquarters, whatever, get in the trucks and then go to the job, and that seems to have changed with uh, many companies. And I w always thought that that possibly could be a way for us to uh, eliminate traffic or eliminate reduce traffic in some small way by requiring somehow requiring that workers Perfect. be brought to the site rather than drive to the site. It's better to have one truck go to the site rather than seven. No question about yeah. that. I mean, I and then there were parking issues in the area too. How you would regulate that? I, I'm not sure, but certainly, the practice of ride sharing would reduce traffic. Mm -hmm. The encouragement to do that certainly is worthy. Right. It is, Chief, one thing that I've talked to you about a number of times, and uh, hopefully, I know how busy you are. Um, hopefully, we're making some progress. We we have two main arteries. Right, we have County Road 39 and Montauk Highway. There's really only two crossings of the Shinnecock Canal. But you know, County Road 39 is a complicated road um, because it's the main thoroughfare, but it, you know, it also has a lot of commercial businesses on it. And even though we have tried to sort of keep the businesses, low traffic generating businesses, 
We've had a number of uh, fatalities and accidents on County Road 39. And when there is, we end up having to shut down a section, particularly if it's a fatality. We're waiting for the medical examiner to get here. Um, medical examiner stuck in the same traffic. Um, suddenly, you know, Hill Street, Montauk Highway, everything comes to like a tremendous stop. Um, and we don't really have a good routing plan for that traffic. And some of it is because there's no way to route the traffic because there aren't fire roads or connector roads. There's no way, nothing that you can open up to let the traffic bypass even slow. So people will call me like, I was in, I sat there for four hours waiting for this accident to clear. I, that's not really acceptable. And I, I don't know what to tell them. Um, so a, a while back I, I reached out to you and said, can we come up with like a series of places where maybe we can construct, you know, gravel roads or dirt roads or, 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 or other connectors so that we have a rerouting plan for these areas where we know that we've had their, their accident prone. Um, so that we don't end up with that four-hour situation. And of course, we've talked about maybe having the ME have somebody, you know, yeah, well, closer. And, and it's not just the ME. It. Sometimes it's our tow trucks that, that take a long time to get there to move a car. Um, but uh, as you know, we have that, that is a, um, it's, it's a great plan, and, and we're working on it. And we already have looked at and identified some areas, such as that that breakthrough that might come out at Hill Station Road, um, which would certainly help. Um, and there are a few other places that we're looking at to see if we can do that. None of these things are easy to do. If they were easy to do, they'd be done already. Um, so, I mean, the public has to understand that these are, you know, we're really up against a, a, a very big challenge to, to find alternative roads, to do the things that we're talking about. Um, but that's not dissuading us from every little nuance that we can make to try and improve things. But on that project, um, we have identified a few. We've, I've been on Zoom calls with you and the county talking about one facet of that that is one of the easier ones, frankly. Um, but we're looking at a couple of others that might open up some bypasses to the main arteries when we do have to shut it down. And I, I'm keenly aware, and I've been in traffic myself, uh, how frustrating it is to sit behind an accident scene for a long period of time. Um, sadly, you know, some of these accidents are very serious, and there are a lot of details that have to go into that investigation and more importantly or as importantly in reconstructing that accident because there are mammoth lawsuits that follow that uh, and those lawsuits rely on the police documentation of that occurrence um, and there's millions of dollars at stake and I, I know how frustrating it is for somebody to sit there but if you were the victim or a family member was a victim um, and it was somebody else's <coughs> fault you would certainly want us to take the time to document that the right way. I understand that, particularly when there's a fatality, you know. Uh, or serious. But I think we do have to do our job in trying to find. Well, the key is, as you said, the key is we may not be able to change the time frame that we're on scene. The key is can we find a way to get around that? Um, and, and I do right. think there's some merits to trying to well, find. I have this like, concept that there'd be some plan somewhere that says if there is a accident in the, this location mm -hmm. this is the rerouting plan right and this is where we need to station officers these are this is the road that we open up through the woods that allows you you know that kind of thing here's what we do if the accident's here yeah. you know that kind of thing if we can get the roads to support that to implement those <laughs> things would be easy getting the roads structure to support that is the difficult part but once we get the road structure to do that, it's very easy for us to signal those, those changes in traffic patterns and for us to redirect the traffic. That's not, that, that would be the easy part of that. The harder part is establishing those alternate routes. Mm. But we're working on it. We're not, we're, no, not giving, we're not throwing our hands up, that's for sure. No, I appreciate it. I'm glad you're there because I know that it'll get done. Um, anything else? 
It's a big you know, it's, it's interesting. We moved this meeting to 11. Normally, these meetings start, it used to start at 10 o'clock, and that was just one little minor change to help some of the board members who and public who are west of the canal. Right. Because that one hour difference cut their commute time by about 30 minutes. Yeah, I'm sure. I ran to it so even, even at the 11 o'clock start. I ran we're into we're it. all doing what we can. Yeah. We're all doing what we can. Yeah. Um, and maybe a combination of small things will lead to a big difference. That's the hope. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, of the Big Brothers program. I, I gave a top copy, but not the. Maybe, you know, I'll, I'll take if you them. have. Here, I gave there you. Go. Oh. There's two of them. They look alike. All right. Kim, I think Sunny yeah, yeah, took yeah. the top one you already. Too. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we're going to take a look at the agenda for the uh, upcoming meeting. This will be Tuesday, the 27th of July. Um, it will be here at Town Hall, and it will start at 6 p.m., so it's an evening meeting. And um, we have uh, just one public hearing. It's on the use of additional special supplementary community development block grant COVID funds to be awarded to the town of Southampton through the Suffolk County Consortium. And then we get to resolutions. So we'll just read these. If anybody has any questions, uh, you let us know. Uh, 37020 authorizes the supervisor to sign a right of entry agreement with PSEG for the planning of PSEG's Bridgehampton to Buell underground cable project. Town Board Resolution 37040 authorized the Parks Director to enter into interim agreements for mobile food concessions pursuant to Town Code 111-7B for 2021 summer season at Hot Dog Beach. 37045 authorized the purchase of one Chevy Tahoe from the New York State OGS contract with uh, Chevrolet of Smithtown. ID 37046 authorized the supervisor to execute a lease agreement with Autochlor system for dishwashing machine. Before you, we go on to the next one, so I have a note that that resolution will need to get amended. Um, 337046? Yeah, so there's the amounts are incorrect. So uh, where, it where it says further resolved um, on the next page, contract line not to exceed, it should say $2,036 in 2021. 2036? Uh, 2036. And then again, uh, in the financial impact, the 1500 goes to 2036. Thank you. Uh, Kim, you got that? Yes. Okay, Town Board ID 37027, authorize the supervisor to execute amendments to interpreter contract for Justice Court. 37037, authorize the supervisor to sign consultant agreement with Thomas Neely, uh, doing business as TFN Advisors. Um, let me just explain this one real quickly. Um, so, you know, Tom, you recently retired, as you know. We have not backfilled that position. We have nobody doing the work that Tom had been doing. And, um, as you know, he was uh, very involved with the Southport Commuter Connection, which I'm hoping is going to return, and we'll have to uh, um, notify the public and get the schedules out and get the, the shuttle buses running again. Um, but besides that, all the, uh, you know, the stop signs, no parking signs, all these changes that uh, we don't have anybody on. So this would be as we need him. Um, we can bring him in at a rate, um, I think, of $75 an hour uh, with a maximum amount for $20,000. Um, I know this is something that's, that's needed, and he has sort of a very specialized knowledge. So uh, I just want to make sure everybody's okay with this. Oh, good. That's $20,000 for the rest of this year? Yes. Okay. Yes. So as a retiree, he can't. I think he's limited to thirty thousand for a year. Um, but um, our goal. I, I have to talk to Chris Fenton about what her long-term plans are in terms of how she's going to fill this function, um, because it's becoming a problem. I, I, you know, for a lot of us that we don't have anybody doing this work, and uh, whether she wants to bring in another engineer or whether. Uh, 
you know, keep somebody on like Tom as a as a consultant, or use other consultants. I don't know what the best approach is, but uh, Tom's willing to do this, and he's certainly uh, very skilled at it. So um, that's why I'm bringing this forward. Um, Julie, Julie, you're next. ID 37050, we're calling amend Town Board Resolution 2020-1090. ID 37048. Um, can, sorry, can we go back? There's um, conflict in the year for that resolution. Do we know if it's 2020? Well, I think it has to be 2020 because we're not up to oh, which 1090. One? Yeah, the one I just read. Yeah. I see that. So should I change those to 2020? I'm not sure if it's 2020 or 2021, so I'll check and find out. Well, I know 2021. The first whereas, 2090. There's yeah. a conflict between the title and the first whereas. Yeah. Um, let me just see if I can remember now. And a resolve. Where is and the time resolve. authorized to execute 2021 youth bureau agreements? With, no, this has it, the title is wrong. Okay, it, so it, it should be 2021. It should be 2021. Yeah. Yeah, because, because it can't it, be. It, no, you can't, can't be saying it can't. It can't be. We're not at 1090 yet. Right? Oh, we're not. Okay, that was, yeah, that was my question. We're so not, I, w I can check it. Yeah. Just to confirm. Okay. What do you mean we're not at? We haven't go gone past resolution 1090 yet. So it can't be, we can't be amending it if we haven't gotten to it. What resolution number we have to? 780 okay, something. So, yeah, so that can't. Okay. So you think the 2020 is correct? But to, I do. But that wouldn't, doesn't make sense either because the Youth Bureau agreements for 2020 would have already been paid. I will check because I do not know. Okay. Appreciate it. Unless it was a multi-year contract with Rodney Rollins. Well, she's going to check it. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> All right, so let's come back to that when, we, when we've got that sorted out. It, it's possible that he was hired in 2020 Right. Okay. On a so, multi-year arrangement. Paula, can you check that? Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, ID 37048. We're calling a man town board resolution 2021-245 to reduce the total local match funding amount for the purchase of two buses for the senior shuttle program. Town board ID 37043. 2021 notice to bidders for Shinnecock Maritime Park. Well, let's stop for a second so I don't understand what we're bidding out. Doesn't say, does it? You have to look at the notice to bidders. I think we sent it out to bid once before and the bids were way too high. Mm. So, so this is the parking lot point. improvement. Right. Um, maybe the pavilion, I think. So we're just re rebidding it? Yes. Okay. Um, 37031, 2020 fund balance allocations for capital borrowing as it relates to debt reduction policy. Um, so this is basically from last year. The fund balance uh, came in higher than anticipated um, by $3.3 million. Um, so we're trying, I guess, to apply that to offset future borrowing. And then the balance um, could go to you know, other priorities. So. so it looks like 1.9 million uh, from the balance, uh, 691,000 from highway, 565,900 from the water district, 135 from waste management. Uh, will we'll go to next year's capital program so that we don't have to borrow as much. So it, it was tricky this year because we did the borrowing so early that we weren't able to apply it. So what Len is trying to do then is to encumber the money and say this will be used for next year's capital. All right. Um, next resolution, 37035, 
accepts donation from Tudor First Management New York, Inc. for the Southampton Town Police Department to amend the 2021 adopted budget. Um, it's funding a luncheon for the Southampton Town Police Youth Camp. 37036 amends the 2021 budget for various departments. 37044 amends the 21 through 25 capital budget for the town hall improvements. 37025 appoints labor management committee for 2021. And from, you know, our team will include myself, Frank Sapone, Sandra Circione, and uh, Juan Becerra. 37024 appoints Michael uh, Carrier, chair of the Architectural Review Board for 2021. 37049, co-sponsor with Councilman establishes a Traffic Solutions Task Force and appoints task force members. We, before we move on past this, I just, uh, um, you know, we've listed a number of people. I, I'm concerned if we get too big with the committee. I'm certainly open to suggestions, but myself and Chief Skrnicki as co-chairs, uh, Councilman Schiavone, um, uh, the highway superintendent, Superintendent Gregor, or if he wants to designate somebody, uh, Ryan Murphy as our public safety director, Tom Houghton uh, from the engineering department, somebody from New York State Highway or DOT, uh, somebody from County DPW, um, Thomas Neely, uh, assuming he's uh, chosen as a transportation consultant to serve on this, uh, Tony. Uh, Phil Arimo, who's uh, the chair of our town transportation committee. And then I put one public rep you know, to be designated, one, one east of the canal and one west of the canal. And uh, you know, we will also hold some sort of public meeting to solicit input, because mm -hmm. some of the best ideas are coming out of the public, um, as I mentioned with some of the roundabout ideas. So, but is there anything glaringly wrong with this that, you know, does anybody want to uh, feel that I've omitted an, a critical voice in this uh, task force? Tony is from Hampton Bays. Tony Filarimo is from Hampton Bays, so I think that's appropriate as well. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Anybody? And we could also add at a later date, too. We could just, it could be like a living the document it could it could change as we go okay um i'll move on three five two seven one authorize additional funds well i want to discuss this uh, authorize additional funds for be ready fishbine hatter and donovan llp to represent the interests of the highway superintendent as it relates to st andrews road i mean i i'm forwarding this resolution because i have been asked to I don't support it. I, Jim, I don't know what to do here because I've reviewed every shred of information and documentation that the highway superintendent is using to support this claim. There isn't, I, you know, I, I can't see anything that justifies that that section of this driveway through, you know, Shinnecock Hills Golf Course is a town road. And we're spending, this is 35000 in taxpayer funds. Yeah. I have looked at the initial resolution back in the 30s and directing the highway superintendent to file the certificate of abandonment. I've looked at the map that was attached to it that says that that section was to be abandoned. I do not understand the basis of the claim and, you know, I'm told, oh, well, we have to, he's a separately elected official, but he's wasting taxpayer money on a frivolous suit. And I don't know what to do here. Yeah. I'm turning to you and saying, I, at some point, any objective review of the documentation says it's not ours. It was traded so they could build County Road 39. Yeah. If, and if you're untrading it, now County Road 39 isn't ours either. So. Right. I mean, I completely I, agree I, with you, Mr. I, I don't know what to my do. point after, you know, quite uh, it's great looking for, into it's great this. great for the law firm and yeah. another $35,000 because, right. Right. you know, uh, on a look, wild goose chase. Looking into this myself, and, you know, as, I, as I've said, as I've mentioned, I've met, I've met 
a number of times with the Suffolk County Department of Public Works prior to the to them able to be, produce the map that really seems to clarify the issues. I met with a number of the people from the Suffolk County Department of Public Works on that issue. Uh, once we had the map, it really does, to me and to you and to others, um, seem to clarify the issue. Um, and I also met with the State Department of Transportation on this. And when I met with the people I, I know from there, from my days with the Attorney General's office, uh, they even, it seemed to even be clearer to me. Uh, the status of the litigation at this point is that the club has made a motion to dismiss and I believe all papers are in at this point, so we're now waiting for a decision from the courts. Uh, I've had n numerous conversations with Peter B. from, from Be Ready. <coughs> I've, met, I've had conversations with the highway superintendent as well on this issue. Um, the, Does he? Speaking with B Peter B.'s firm, they feel that there are some issues. I, I think, what as I've they? always said, I haven't heard a single one. Bring it to the logical conclusion, what, like you had mentioned, if in some magical way that th the the agreement from 1932 did not encompass what is being referred to as St. Andrews East, you know, the portion of St. Andrews Road that was east of Tuckahoe, if by some way somebody, if the courts were to conclude that that was not part of the the, the swap, um, yeah, I, like you mentioned, I think you could, there could be a uh, concern that. Uh, that portion east, uh, that portion of County Road 39 east of Tucko could be in jeopardy as a public road. So, uh, can we just like, go over the like the salient facts on this, right? So, the county wanted to build County Road 39. It was right smack through the middle of two fairways of the original Shinnecock Hills Golf right, Course. As far as I know, yeah. We had a road, St. Andrews Road, that went up to Tuckaho Road. The county needed land of the Shinnecock from Shinnecock Hills Golf Course. The entire golf course had to be shifted up to the north, right? A trade was made for that portion of St. Andrews Road, parallel to County Road 39. Now they had no way of finishing St. Andrews Road, so they actually agreed to build that loop that we know today goes you know, under, under right. the sunrise, right. and under 39, and then loops back around. They wouldn't need to build that loop if they still had a road that reached Tuckahoe. Right. It would have been completely unnecessary. Why spend all that money to right. build that road? Right. There's a map that says to be abandoned on both sections, both east and west of Tuckahoe Road, clearly marked, no question about it. There's a description of square footage that is being transferred. It matches those two sections of road. So where, and there's a direction of the highway superintendent back in this from the 1930s directing him to file the certificate of abandonment, which he fails to do for either section of that road. So where, what is the confusion here? You said there might be something, there might be something. What is that something? Because I have not heard anything. The facts are as clear as day here. And look, if there was something there, I 100% support it. Right. If it's ours, great. But if it was traded in good faith so that we could build County Road 39, and they had to completely reposition the golf course to do this, then we're acting in bad faith at this point, and we're throwing away tax dollars. Mm. Uh, and does the highway superintendent is, get to do that? Originally, you know, did the highway superintendent have the, you know, the authority or the position to, to bring this action? You know? and at that time, it was if we were going to fight that part of it, We'd have to fund both his lawsuit and we'd have to fund outside counsel because my office would be conflicted. Um, and so we decided to let him proceed on this. Uh, I, again, it instead of hopeful. Like $12,000. Now it's right, right. an additional 35000 Right. No, I, I agree. I think. You know, so can I, can I ask a question running here? And, I and without have, showing me one shred of evidence yeah. that there's a I would basis to the claim. I would say, and I don't want to necessarily, if it's litigation, I don't want to say too much about this, but. On public record, but um, I think well, I believe kind of the position I, of I was I wanted right. to allude to a little bit. In right. that I, just, just I mean, uh, the position from what I, uh, you know, my earlier discussions a number of years ago with the highway superintendent 
and with the consultants, um, the highway superintendents consultants, the engineering consultants, it wasn't at that time the legal consultants. Um, there, I believe uh, the highway superintendent's um, position was reading the resolutions and, and, and the way it was described, he felt that the swaps involved uh, only roads that were uh, west of Tuck Island and it did not involve the road, as we mentioned, referred to as Sandy. Have you seen that written anywhere? Where it says just west of Tucko? No. Yeah, the, the resolution, yeah. I said the, the, the 1932 resolution say. itself, yeah. It, it, says, it says all portions of it. Right, right. Yeah, it's not the clear. I mean, at the, the time, it was 1932. I mean, I think nowadays it might have been you know, more uh, clearly uh, stated, but. Um, no, it, it's it was always been my position that it involved both sides. I mean, it, if you bring it out to logical conclusion, and then uh, again, um, the county was not be able. We we did not have the map that you referred to, with Mr. Supervisor. No, and I understand until, the original a while confusion. Back. I understand right, right. the original confusion, but once that map was produced I, by the county, I don't, I don't disagree. That, that should that have time. been the end of it, right? In my mind. Right. So, so my, Councilor, my question, Jim, was. Well, we probably went over that area already. <laughs> yeah. My question was, what's in front of the board right now is a decision to spend thirty-five thousand right. dollars, and yet I'm understanding funds have already. Well, I'm understanding that this is still in court, right. and we're awaiting a decision. Right. So, what are we actually spending this for? Well, and it's because of the billing. The is it billing to retain that the that lawyer? They have done they've, they've, the, the 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 firm. This firm that represents the highway superintendent has has. Uh, build this amount already in you know, from their preparing for filing the complaints and now um, you know doing their own research uh, yeah uh, doing their own research filing the complaints and now responding to the motion to dismiss so this is their litigation it's work right, so done. yeah it's work they've so done my follow -up yeah, they, I mean, question and they have done a lot of times I mean I've had discussions with Peter B and I've asked him to sharpen his pencil as far as the billing and and he understands that and I think Maybe there will be some further discussions. I'm hoping that the decision on the motion to dismiss will be come relatively soon, and and that it'll be. So is there an if urgency? It comes the way we think it pay, might come. Is there an urgency for us discussion. to pay this this right now? I mean, I, I'm trying to decide if this board. Maybe just tell me what happens if this board votes no. Mm 